Welcome and thank you very much for joining us at Campaign's second online briefing of uh, 2021. Uh, this is going to be on the subject of e-commerce. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know me, you're lucky, uh, but unfortunately that's an hour over. I'm Austin Allison, I'm the editor of Campaign Middle East. Uh, we must be doing something right here because we've got an awful lot of people joining us, so this is uh, looking good. Although that could be down to the great speakers that we have and who I'll introduce in just a minute. Or perhaps it's down to what an important topic e-commerce is. COVID pushed all of us, consumers and brands alike, to e-commerce in a big way last year. And uh, we're going to be looking at the topic from a couple of different angles, user experience and disruption and reinvention. So before we move on, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors who make all of this possible. Um, Shoeri Group is the leading media representation group in the Middle East today. It was built from the ground up over the past 40 years. And with their uh, diverse portfolio of more than 50 media companies across television, radio, print, out of home, digital, cinema, they've got best in class data, tech, content abilities. So Shoeri Group can definitely help your brand deliver results at scale and across platforms. Thanks also to um, our uh, a new sponsor, uh, Araby Ads, who's the largest e-commerce marketing platform in the region. And I really hope that together with Araby Ads, we can bring some more innovative marketing solutions to this region. Of course, goes without saying, keep reading campaign online, in print, on social. In fact, on social, we got our Instagram blue tick today. So uh, feeling very pleased with that. My next, uh, my next mission is to get us banned. Um, not really. Um, sign up for our newsletters, listen to our podcasts, and keep attending all these virtual briefings so we can, uh, uh, until we can get safely back in a room together. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first panel. This is going to be on uh, user experience. It's going to be moderated by Sabiha Iqbal, who's the Managing Director of Accenture Interactive, Build Experience Leaders at Accenture Interactive. She's joined by Stephanie Cunningham, General Manager of E-Commerce uh, MENA, Omnicom Middle East, uh, uh, Omnicom Media Group. Um, and that's uh, one, of the, one of the sections of Omnicom is Transact E-Commerce Agency. Uh, we're joined by Stefan Davis, the General Manager of Customer Experience and Network Development at Al Masood Automobiles through in Abu Dhabi. And we're joined by Khalil Yassin, who is the Vice President of Customer Development Operations Arabia and Customer Development Capability MENA at Unilever. So I'd now like to pass over to Sabiha to get the conversation going. You guys are, are up and I will take a step back. Thank you so much. Thanks, very excited to be here today, guys. Um, as Austin mentioned, we have a rich panel. Uh, I am Sabiha Iqbal and uh, I'm a managing director with Accenture Interactive and I'll be the moderator for today. Um, I am gonna pass it over to Austin and the team to kind of give a, some context as their background so we can then head into the questions. Go ahead, Austin. Uh, so go ahead, uh, Steph, sorry. Hi guys, so I'm Steph. Um, I've got a specialist e-commerce background. So over 10 years working at the likes of Unilever, Amazon, estate order companies. Currently I'm leading Transact, which is an e-commerce consultancy in the Middle East powered by Omnicom Media Group. So over to Stephen to intro yourself. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm, uh, I'm Stephen, um, general manager of uh, customer experience and network development here at Al Masood Automobiles in Abu Dhabi. Um, I've been in the region for the last six years, um, working for um, another big conglomerate in the in the in the region in automobiles, uh, and I've seen lots of change in the last um, six years, certainly within the region. Um, previously, um, in, from the UK, very much retail driven, customer driven, and experience driven. So over to you, Khalil. Hi, this is uh, Khalil Yassin. I'm uh, Lebanese and born in Saudi Arabia. Been in this region almost. Uh, 50 years. My birthday, by the way, is 23rd of March. Okay, so a week from now. Uh, it's 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 great to be with all of you and happy to really share a real life experience on all questions which will be directed to me. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Um, just to add, of course, e-commerce is very close to my heart. It's something that I've seen through the years uh, being here in the UAE and the Middle East kind of take off. So um, I'm very excited for this conversation. Um, so we're all really focused on the business of experience, especially since, um, you know, the whole COVID-19. 
Uh, today, what I want to do is we'll get into experience, user experience, and how that's impacting loyalty and customer themselves. And actually, uh, personally, how we feel about the brands that we're transacting and tracking with and, and what our experiences are and how we can actually move the needle. Um, so in that um, sort of context, I wanted to ask Khalil, starting with yourself, um, mm -hmm. what do you feel has accelerated the shift to commerce uh, for some some of the key considerations that we have and we should keep in mind for this acceleration. A lot of companies have moved uh, towards commerce, moving from brick and mortar. Um, just wanted to understand what you think is, is creating the best customer experience. Sure. <clears throat> I think, first of all, I would like to really share from real life example, uh, uh, experience. It's, uh, when we talk yeah. about you know, e-commerce is part of the digital uh, uh, disruptions, which is happening globally, and it's, it's accountability of the leadership of the organization on how they need okay, to accelerate it and move forwards. And they look to the business in terms of long terms, how it will be benefiting the entire business. Uh, we've been in this uh, journey almost a year in, in uh, uh, Unilever. And we have really looked at what is the best way how to create a platform, okay, which is really can take you uh, through a journey of the customers uh, across from the login to the checkouts and every elements, okay, it is, has to be very interactive to retain and convert the consumers, okay, in, in, in their journey. So therefore, it is very important for us to really ensure that when we develop a platforms which is can really cater, okay, to a certain aspects, okay, in the journey and ensure that consumer is really interacted uh, from end to end. Plus, also, it's not only about you know interacting when it comes to when you uh, log in or you check in and the check out. It's all the experience comes also beyond that. When we talk about the picking, packing and delivery and the customer service beyond that for anticipating a certain complaints which might really happen uh, after the delivery. So it is, it is really essential for, for uh, everyone in, in real business, okay, to really move uh, with, with the mindset of uh, e-commerce uh, future. So sort of creating the best experience at every touch point as we move along the entire sort of funnel, right? The purchase funnel from engaging the customer. Absolutely, absolutely. Certainly, I totally agree. Um, I think that it's also very important to make sure that we're sort of considering those key moments. Um, Steve, from your from your experience, especially since you're in the automotive industry and and um, it is a lot about finding those data points for the customers, um, how are you finding that change and and sort of the customer behavior when it comes to moving to commerce. Mm, yeah, it's, um, in, in in automotive, it's 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 quite it's quite a standard core model. Um, but what we've seen, the change in what we've seen is is how customers are, are more interactive towards video, and uh, more towards chatbot, more towards things that give them give them the answer or give them the visibility easily for them. If you take the, the, the COVID situation as an example, um, and, and we go back to April last year where uh, no one was walking through our doors, we had to we had to step we had to step into the into the commerce world a lot a lot faster, and we did it a lot faster than any of our com competitors. Um, we were able to spin pivot um, Teams meetings or Zoom meetings with customers. Customers were um were wanting to do it they were they were they were accepting the way we wanted to do things and we we changed our model very quickly although it was it wasn't set up in a way that it was uh, all shiny it was just we could get we could actually do business via commerce we could take payments online we could we could do that we've now we've now evolved that we've now got we've now got e-commerce we've got our e-commerce site um we've now um, derived into making sure that we have digital convenience um, but if you look at if you look at the customer's uh, uh, journey on and the digital points, there's so many points that digital comes in, even though it's in the physical world. So you'll step in digital. Um, you may want a valuation on your vehicle. You have to go back into uh, you come in and you go back into digital. You get the valuation. You come back down. You may want to buy the car. No, I don't want to decide here. I go home and I step back into digital. So. 
the online, offline, online mode is something that will certainly grow out here in, in the region, definitely. Yeah, I, th I think the, the frictionless experience or taking it um, and sort of immersive experience of, of bringing in the digital into your online offline is, is quite important. And uh, we see it sort of breaking apart when we don't have those, uh, those avenues for the customer, right? Especially when it comes to customer uh, experience and then being able to get customer feedback. Um, certainly. certainly. For uh, that kind of brings us to sort of companies going through this digitalization, right? And how, again, it has been accelerated. This is something that we're seeing. Um, Steph, what do you think are the main considerations for businesses when they're going through this transformation? Yeah, so e-commerce is one of the key sources of growth. We've seen traditional channels like offline sales and offline retailers in decline. So it's top priority for companies to set up an e-commerce or digital transformation and, and a strategy. What I would really recommend is to ensure that they know what their full company strategy is and then what role e-commerce can play to support that. It shouldn't be a standalone strategy. It needs to be completely interwoven. And for a lot of companies, e-commerce is going to be completely new. Do they know what that end goal is? Can they hire the right talent to break that strategy down and achieve the right plan to drive that forward? And that, that talent needs to be experienced to help change mindsets, help influence across the business to drive that change. So, you know, in, in, in summary, I think that you need to make sure that e-commerce and digital is fully integrated into your strategy to help achieve your overarching goals as a company or a brand. You need to find the right talent to help drive that, to influence your company and, and train your company to put that roadmap into place. Yeah, and I, I think the, the, the key is there, that vision, right? The vision you talked about. Um, is, this, is this something that you're seeing happening uh, with the different companies? Because what I'm seeing and what I've noticed is that the vision is there, but because there's this race to come on and get uh, online and get commerce going, the vision gets lost and we have segmented departments from your sales to your marketing to your operations, which have a target, but maybe it's not really, you know, uh, the, the one vision. Yeah, exactly. It's that age old argument of commerce versus versus brand and marketing. If it's if it's completely embedded and completely together, it has that seamless journey across your business that Stephen was just mentioning for buying a car. It's completely you're changing channels, you're changing teams, you're changing touch points. If you can interweave e-commerce effectively in your business, as opposed to this shiny new thing and a project, it needs to be integral in your business model. Um, and it needs to be aligned to you know, the strategy and the goals to achieve your growth. So, so yeah, we've been seeing it. And I think there's a lot of um, you know, people trying to seek out the right talent in the region or turn to agencies to help you know, get them moving and get them started. That's a lot of sense. So from, from that, um, I think that uh, the key issue that I've seen, and, and please uh, chime in any time, is that that how do we take the physical and the digital customer experience and make it real, right? Of course, like you're saying, it's a shiny new thing. We need to think about it as it's a business of experience. It's not just the marketing. It's not just, uh, as you were mentioning, uh, one or two. It's really the end-to-end -end journey. Um, for me, that physical, digital customer experience is very important. And I want to understand, maybe Khalil, from yourself, how is the industry responding to this? How are you seeing this change? And how are you making this and sort of bringing it into your uh, your sales journey or in your stores or how you're selling the products? Okay. I think it's uh, traditionally is this region been uh, <clears throat> focusing on, on offline, uh, which is majority of supermarket and even wholesalers, which is also contribute a lot in Saudi Arabia. And the region which is I grown up, okay, I've seen that consumer is they have more convenience in, in going to the stores and they start shopping. And suddenly, okay, you start, there is a major change has happened in the MENA region where people, they seekers for more convenience. And, and convenience is for them is, is much uh, better for uh, being at home or being in an office and order something and they utilize that other time and, and, and uh, other things which is the, they can uh, uh, have it with their families or their friends. So it was, it, it become not a, a real important for them to really shop offline. So, and there is a behavior changes that start happening in the Arabian and the MENA region. 
And noticeably has happened in Saudi Arabia where when, when the lockdown happened to us in March last year, I have seen and witnessed, okay, the way how the entire offline customers, okay, has moved into the online. And I will, I will tell you one thing, which is, for example, in, in Saudi Arabia, Banda, they have launched their online platforms in two months' time. And the Nahdi, they have bought up fleets, okay, for fulfillment and the last mile with a more than 200 uh, uh, cars, which is they can really access to the entire industry. A wholesaler, which is I never been expecting him to really come close to the e-commerce world. He said the e-commerce has saved me when I build my dark store and I build a B2B platforms into my business. So it has evolved very fast and rapidly, okay, which has really helped the entire business okay, to really survive in a very tough time where it is, it's been uh, reported that almost around 33% of the consumer uncomfortable to go to the grocery anymore. And in Saudi, for example, 60% of population, they went online and they shop online during the COVID. And all the retailers, they have seen it, it's a big shift, okay? And they have to cope themselves, okay? With that, a new way of how to really uh, sell and serve the consumers. So still it's evolving stage because we look to the three things, which is very important to build up the capability of people who's running the e-commerce world, which is, I think it is, will catch up very soon in the coming two years. It makes a lot of sense. I think that it would be interesting to understand in that, where is it sort of breaking up, right? Where is it falling apart? Because of course we're all, it's, it's a learning experience. A lot of these, even like the smaller companies that are moving from brick and mortar are starting up and they're, they're just getting into it. So it's that education, self-education and sort of understanding of how to build that e-commerce business because it's not just a digital platform as you were you were mentioning it is the business that's helping them to sell it's helping them to accelerate um, during covid and uh, and kind of moving their entire uh, customer base uh, distributing at least the customer base to this digital platform but I, I it would be interesting to understand where it's it's not working right where we're doing things which are not working which need to be addressed yeah, I think it's, there is two areas which is we need to really focus uh, on. The first area is we need to really build up the uh, knowledge, okay, and uh, and transfer it, okay, with what is it is for the customers to really move into the e-commerce and what is benefiting him. So this is one. So how we really educate our customers. The other one is when it comes to the infrastructure. You know, is the two things which is very critical in e-commerce world is the fulfillment, okay, and the last mile. Definitely. And and and, and maybe is a Dubai. It's an easy, especially when it comes to the last mile, because I think they've been advanced a bit in terms of so many uh, last miles companies, which is really serving. But Saudi is a bit scattered country which is like, okay, major city, Jeddah, Riyadh, Dammam, okay, but then you have the north and the southern region, they is still the infrastructure is, is not in uh, reach. So therefore, I think it is, there is two uh, uh, things, uh, obligate, uh, one is, I think, is our uh, obligations at the, as a leaders in the, this region, that's how we keep educating our customers and how to help them to build up their capabilities. And we are doing that with so many wholesalers to really convert them into B2B platforms mm -hmm. and how, also how to really identify entrepreneurs, okay, where we can really fund them and they really start, this is the fulfillments and the last mile, which is a, 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 when we have time, I can tell you a story of a platforms which we have created in Unilever called Unidukan in 45 days, okay, in, in Saudi and in UAE. Fantastic, it's great to hear. Um, I think can that- I, can, I, can I just touch on, just touch on the, the bricks to the, in sales, we in, we have a legacy a legacy model that's been there for hundreds hundreds years, right? It's, it's, you, you come in, you purchase a car, you take it, you drive it, you, you drive away. And what we've noticed is that a lot more people now are, are doing more research online, so our content needs to be a lot lot clearer and a lot more transparent, especially out here in the region. You know, we need to be showing more about prices, understanding what the product is. So we've had to do, have a rethink. We've, 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 we've had a rethink about 
the, the mobility solutions that we provide, the app, the videos, the in-store in, in digital solutions that help you keep inside that digital journey. And we ha we're having to create um, an ecosystem of products um, where a customer could just pick and choose. And the issue that we are having from the bricks to digital is the data sharing. So there's so much data out there on the, on, on the web being able to find out more about the behaviors of that customer and um, what were they looking at, what did they touch, when did they touch, what time did they view. And it's great to have that on a, on a, on a 360, on a, customer, on a customer fact sheet that we can all view. That's where we, the bricks to the clicks is pieces. We're not getting that data inside the bricks. Once we get that, we'll be able to start this seamless, more uh, seam, uh, seamless journey through, through sales, through to, through to service. So that's where we're at with the, the journey. And I have to leave now. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. We understand. Steve has a, a fire to put out right now. So thank yes, you so much thank you. Bye -bye. for joining us. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye. Yeah, maybe um, Sabia, I can add to that. So the original question was, was more around the impact that COVID has driven on the e-commerce industry as well. Um, so some of the things that we saw across the board were, you know, the reduction on cash on delivery payments, uh, more people choosing card, which helps retailers deliver more completed and more successful delivery rates, um, contactless deliveries. Um, more and more companies going direct to consumer and launching their own e-commerce platforms to reach their consumers, whether that was in a short term solutions such as WhatsApp ordering or, or working with marketplaces to get their shopping shops live. Um, ultimately, the landscape has shifted tr tremendously since the impact of COVID. You've seen things such as, you know, grocery and FMB rapidly growing online. That was the fastest growing e-commerce channel, the rise of super apps and that on demand and speed. The question now is not this, you know, this there's too many retailers trying to get attention from, you know, a set range of, of end consumers. So it will all be around which online retailers are going to survive in this highly fragmented and competitive landscape. Um, so this consolidation will happen, but consumers are now, you know, so used to shopping online that it has accelerated this, this channel tremendously. Yeah. And, and I think that your point about the, even just the super apps is actually quite interesting because we're seeing a huge rise in that. Right. And we're seeing them everywhere. It'd be interesting to also understand where that is going because we see it, we see people are interested and actually even in Saudi Arabia, there's a lot of that, you know, uh, bringing the country together or not only just for commerce, but also for a lot of different areas and in, uh, industries that commerce is actually going across be it self care or or others um what do you just kind of like throwing it out there what do you what do you yeah. what is your kind of view on super apps i i think it's a, it's a it's a growing trend and actually i think the middle east and north africa is way ahead globally with with this solution so we've seen kareem hunger station insta shop are going beyond what they originally known for so i think it's all around you know owning this audience building trust with what you know their hero and their anchor offering and then adding on and trialing new verticals um, as they come you know kareem's shoot super app i'm a huge fan is it's great the whole ecosystem um, they offer, you know, taxis, but then they've got their loyalty points to rope in people to do their food shopping and their grocery shopping. So it'll be interesting to know if this is going to dilute their propositions or it's going to empower them further. Um, so I think our region is one to watch with super apps and we will be leading globally on, on, on where that goes, which is really exciting. Yeah. It, it, it is it is interesting and, and with a lot of the industry coming into it it'll be interesting um so i think that that leads me to what is the biggest challenge right because i think everybody's trying to solve it everybody's trying to solve this through super apps through um sort of creating that online offline experience what is the biggest challenge when it comes to customer experience and, uh, yeah. and i'll direct you to you steph and then i'd love to yeah. hear from yourself uh khalil as well yeah so i think when it comes to e-commerce it it should be seen holistically to deliver best in class customer experience. It's, it's not just the experience on the, the website or the app. It's not just the marketing. It's bringing together all of these different aspects of the shopping journey. So behind the scenes, the right strategy and relationship with the, the retailer to access data, the right operations to make sure that your stock or your services are available in the right quantities that are not selling out, the right product availability, the right content experience that you're giving informed and clear information 
information at the point of purchase to inspire and encourage add to basket and then the right marketing plan that takes people from you know fast touch all the way through to point of purchase and then the right post-purchase experience so the right ECRM campaigns or customer services teams um, you know contacting you afterwards and and there's so many things involved in delivering a best in class e-commerce customer experience there's so many different teams so the biggest challenge is having someone that can oversee all of that with the right experience to bring together all of those aspects um, holistically to deliver that end result and what we're seeing is you know potentially distributors and brand teams or agencies not fully connected therefore we're putting live campaigns and then um, potentially the, the stock isn't there so we're not delivering the best amount so these are, are common issues that are occurring and, and they uh, we've seen across the board so I think if you can get the right generalist person in place to bring together all of those different aspects you are going to deliver a best in class customer experience. Yeah. And also I would like to build uh, something which is the most important things is always when we look to the customer experience is how this platforms is interactive, okay, platforms with the uh, consumer. And also beyond that, okay, after, you know, the delivery taking place, okay, how we can really keep our emotional interactions with, with, the, with our consumer. And this is, I think it's required a certain, uh, 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 techniques, okay, built in the platforms which keep, you know, talking to that consumer, even they are uh, not really shopping on the uh, on, on online. So I think this is this is something always I tell my team is don't really uh, get something which is really uh, uh, a bit silence, okay, that's I go and check in, I ask what I want, and then you are not really coming with a proposal, okay, that's you can increase my basket size, or you can really divert me into another segment, which was not in my thoughts. So how you can bring this artificial intelligence tools, okay, which is can really interact with me uh, beyond, okay, the time which I, I use that platform. Yeah, it actually does. It does make sense. And, and actually, just speaking to actually both of your uh, comments is that um, it is that emotional connection, right? And it's making sure that you're getting it right. Because what does experience mean? It does, is it is it the right experience when it comes to um, the how you're being able to purchase it? The, the product or that you're able to interact with customer service or you're able to just cancel your order quick enough, right? At what stage um, is it that we define or the customer defines it as the best customer experience on this platform? And I think that if you look at getting it right, like Seth, you were saying, and, and I think Khalil, what you were also mentioning by getting the right proposition, I think that is, is something to be considered and I'm not seeing it um, so much so in, in a lot of the different companies, right? They're, they haven't got it completely right. Um, there are places where it's falling apart where you have awesome fulfillment, but if you go call customer service, it, it falls apart there or uh, the other way around where you call contact center, great, they're there. However, they don't have your product. They don't understand the product or they don't understand what you've received. So that disconnect is happening. Um, how, are, how are we sort of, and, and sort of just going down that line, how are we sort of supporting from, from the retailer perspective as well as sort of the, the industry and how we're looking at um, helping them out do we see where where it's working? Because I've I've seen both. Look, you, if you're going to think of a, a player that has done it well, look, Amazon has set the benchmark high. Um, they've set you know the the clear strategy. Uh, the teams are trained on it. Everything's connected. One version of truth everyone's tapping into. Um, all teams are working in the same way to deliver the end user a strong customer experience. So they've set the bar high, and and it's yeah, it's one to replicate and still with pride for sure. Yeah, yeah. So when I was thinking about that, Amazon is the only one that actually came to mind because you do have that one click and you can cancel, you can get customer service and they know you and they know where you are. So yeah, um, it would be interesting to see that replicated here. Also something which is we need to really understand, Amazon when they started, they started in 1994. And when they break even in 2003. So when they build the business, okay, they spend like a quality nine years okay to really get this model right and where they are today is like 50 percent of the entire you know e-commerce in, in in united states which is for uh, three times i would say is the arab gdp so what the message which i want to make here is how to really uh, uh, have a mindset with a continuous improvements 
Okay, so that means you can master it. And always you, you revisit the entire customer journey and keep asking a feedback and get this feedback and improve it further on and on and on. And, and things will be uh, uh, helping the entire process while uh, they are in that journey. Makes sense. And that kind of like leads us into sort of marketing, right? What, it, what do we really think about um, value and what kind of value we're creating for business and for customers? Um, Khalil, what are, you, what are you thinking that retailers need to consider when they think about the customer retention strategies that they're putting in place? The most important thing is they should really uh, not lose these customers. They should really retain retain the customers because losing a customers it will cost you like in Harvard Business Review they said it's around twenty five uh, times will cost you to really get it. So the more you are closer to your customers, listening and getting the feedback from customers, it always will help you to really increase. Uh, 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 the way how we are interacting with them. And also we should really have a scorecards, okay, which is really can tell you ex and measure as a KPIs, which is really uh, can uh, drive a decision-making in the organization. And one of them is, is, is the KPIs, which is, is, is about the uh, uh, current, uh, uh, which is losing uh, 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 customers, okay? And if you don't really find out the root cause behind it and you don't really sort it out, it might really uh, amplify and it can be a big issue for the company. So getting closer to the customers and analyze, okay, with all the tools you have, I think it will help you to prevent those type of uh, losing customers. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, you, you know, we're thinking about retention, but if you can deliver a best in class fast experience for the shopper, you've really nailed what your e-commerce value proposition is and why someone should buy from you. And then they have a positive end to end shopping experience on your platform or from your app, then this will lead to, you know, a positive post purchase experience. They'll be thinking of you to return. And then you can layer on these retention programs, whether that's retargeting your ECRM program. Um, and later down the line, once you've built your audiences, developing, you know, a best in class loyalty program offers and um, points or, you know, whatever benefits that you can offer that offer relevancy to your audience base to get them to come back and shop and shop again. And I know Amazon is an easy one to point to again, but they, they make sure that every experience is, is a great one. And if it's not, you know, they have the best in class customer experience um, and customer service offering to make it a positive experience. And then they layer on their programs such as Prime to lock people in and, and develop that loyalty. And we've seen, uh, you know, the likes of Kareem bring in their, their uh, loyalty program as well to, to mirror that program. So I think you need to nail the first shopping experience, build your audiences, understand who they are, develop the right marketing plan to re-engage, and then layer on that with a, a loyalty program once you've built and got to that critical size. Makes a lot of sense, kind of like a sandwich. Uh, make sure you got the experience right, Make sure you're going to be giving the offers, the right offers at the right time, and make sure you kind of put the next bun at the underneath, which is just going to be about making sure you have the right retention programs and, and have the continuous loyalty. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, so I, I think that um, there, there is uh, something to do with something real about personalization and hyper-personalization. Um, in this, in the retention model, what we're talking about, it, it does um, sort of strike me and and the question would really be I think a lot of people are also considering is it is it hyper personalization that's that's relevant and important or do we think that um, you know a correlated proposition is is the same or is it enough um, Khalil would you be I, I, I will that? answer this one and give you a real uh, life example <clears throat> and back in 2019 I. I want to really experience the real digital world. So I have uh, Instagram and Instagram, I just really uh, like something, which is Columbia University came with a program. I said, I love it. Okay, tick. then after a day, I found Columbia, MIT, Harvard and everything. So that's me and there is a back end, some artificial and algorithm is working. Okay, and personalize something on content, which I want to really see in these platforms. And this is where it's really, they kept really 
sending me different uh, uh, promotions, okay, which is I like one of them and I joined MIT on this one of the program, which is the advanced management and entrepreneurial skills. And then I start really experience it furthermore. So I start shifting from education to fashion. Then I moved from fashion to uh, uh, singers, okay, and arts. And then I have seen the way how is the machine learning start really, okay, uh, giving me something which is really what I, I need. So it's very important for, uh, for, uh, for a business like e-commerce to really come out and personalize something which is really cater the needs, okay, of the, of, of the user. And so many people, they, they have a certain questions. Are you collecting a data? Actually, they are not collecting your personal data or they breach your privacy. Actually, they are really creating a cohort and segments, okay, which is really caters that uh, particular uh, needs. Sure. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and, it, and it touches on the AI sort of driven marketing as well. Um, that, that I think commerce is, is, is really based on, and it's actually moving towards as well with data, along with you know, how we're answering and responding to operations. Um, from a, an e-commerce uh, perspective, just kind of going a little bit deeper into um, a marketer's view, um, uh, what do you feel uh, right now, and, and Steph, uh, maybe to you, um, it, how are marketers best executing that the best in class experience and how are they selling through uh, maybe different partners in retail sites like Amazon, Noon, InstaShop and, and where do you see that going because it is it is something that's come up. Yeah sure so I think again working with if you if you are selling indirectly with retail partners like Amazon or Noon it's essential to make sure you've got the basics in place so have you checked out your product range is it all listed as you expect are all the products available do you have the best content so you're driving organic findability to rank and search and then how are you layering on retail media to disrupt the shopper in a busy shopping environment so people consider your products within that that space and then beyond that how are you using certain formats so shoppable media formats um facebook collab ads or you know the likes of that that we can track from awareness and marketing right through to purchase in a seamless manner um, with no digital dead ends so i think it's all around you know ensuring the basics are fixed you've got the right content your products are available in the right amount um, secondly, really understanding their retail media that's available to disrupt and stand out ahead of your competition. And then looking at the off-site media options that are available. So co-op, collab, shoppable media formats that can drive that seamless journey from awareness right through to purchase. And also this uh, IA is, uh, is becoming very essential in, in marketing uh, team to really make a decision, as you said, especially from uh, media buying or the user segmentations, or uh, in, uh, even in terms of comes on forecasting and uh, calculate the return investments on the projected uh, forecast uh, as well. Yeah, and I, I think that um, speaking to that, it, it makes, the question that I'm, I'm hearing and, and what I think a lot of people wonder is that who is the right person to partner with, right? We can put our products on Amazon or, or we can put our products on Noon and what's the right proposition? Um, I'm seeing that that strategic thinking and that is where there's a lot of support needed. Have you seen uh, have you seen things like this? Because it's either I put it on a partner site or I create my own site and there's a tension between what they should be doing. Yeah, look, it all comes down to your, your channel strategy. What is the, the role of all of your routes to market in your business, offline, your own direct to consumer proposition, and then each of your retail partners? How are you um, using these to get to your end goal? How are they differentiated? And um, how are you building winning partnerships with your retailers? Are they collaborative? Are they working with you to unlock joint business plans that are helping to accelerate, you know, joint goals with you as your brand and them as a retailer to develop this space. Um, so we would always work with our clients to map out the market. Who are the retailers? What is the right distribution strategy? What is the right channel strategy? And how are you going to differentiate your experience within each of those channels to meet the end shop emission goals? And, and that, that plan then you know, drips down to how you activate um, and then ultimately it lines back up to what is your, you know, your, your end goal, your revenue goal. Um, so yeah. Yeah, 
it, it makes a lot of sense. I think uh, it is about thinking about the end-to-end -end business and what your experience and how you want to define it for sure. Um, since we're almost finished with this session, I wanted to ask you guys just the, you know, off the cuff, um, where do you see, looking forward, where do you see that, that, that we are going? What is the future of commerce and, and what do you put your bet on, right? What is it that you think uh, we need to consider and we need to watch out for? Yeah, it's a, it's a really big one. So I think it's, it's it all comes down to being able to, to own your audiences. If you don't have a direct to consumer proposition, um, can you adapt your brand? Can you innovate your business model to be able to own the relationship with your end consumer, whether you're a B2B distributor um, and you're setting up your own contact system to be able to interact online with your end players, or whether you're a traditionally, um, you know, an FMCG player that's always relied on end retail. Tailors. I feel like the disruption that's going to happen, particularly in our region, is, is um, brands and companies opening up their own direct to consumer proposition and, and owning that end to end experience, building their data. And, and um, yeah. yeah. I, for, from my point of view, I think there is a very clear what I, I've seen that the evolutions and where this business is, is heading in the MENA region. Marketplace, which is really serve the route to market, is one thing, okay, going to happen. We like it, we don't like it. And it's all about the pure uh, B2B, and this is really going to make a big disruptions in the markets. We have seen it and noticed it in, in UE with the Bigro. We've seen it with Nasari in Saudi Arabia. And this is, it is uh, in line with the, also the government's also visions in terms of really transforming and the having clear transactions and also transparency in the money movements as well. And for companies like us in Unilever, this is going to help us to really uh, reduce our cost. And, and this is a big shift. The other one, I can see a big shift, which is, I think, the D2C, which is this is direct to the consumer because, you know, Companies, they come out with their own platforms and they try to really cater something. I told you, I'm going to talk to you mm -hmm. about the Dukan, which is a platform we created in 45 days, which is catered only to the employees of corporates. So mm -hmm. we give them a certain discount, which is uh, better than the available in the offline. And this is how we can really uh, reward, okay, the certain employees in, in particular corporates, okay, to, to really buy uh, and experience Unilever products. And, and we have seen that, you know, when we recruit like Saudi Airline into this platforms and Saudi Airline, they said, oh, oh, can we really market and have a banners on, on, on your platform? We said, yes, you can do it. We give it to you now free, but tomorrow you're going to pay for it. So I think this is, can become another way how this business will be evolved further more more, okay, uh, with the uh, uh, B2B and, and, and B2C. This is, I've seen it. It makes a lot of sense, uh, Khalil. And, and Steph and Khalil, thank you so much. I think that, uh, I think that's exactly um, it. I do agree. And it, it actually, it would be really good to watch out what it is. Um, when it comes to uh, sort of data-driven or AI-driven or intelligent platforms, I am seeing, as you guys are both mentioning, the marketplace on steroids, right? And it is that entire ecosystem play where we're seeing people partner up. Nobody is doing it alone. We, we they're basically partnering up and then expanding, right? So I think that we have a lot to look forward to. And uh, actually, I'd love to continue this conversation, but we are at times up. And, uh, and I will um, thank you guys for being here. And thank you so much for letting me moderate this. It was, it was quite an experience. And I'll hand it Thanks over, to Austin. I think you're there. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. That was absolutely amazing. Um, we ran a little bit over time, and I wish that we could have an awful lot more time. These, um, we don't have time for questions, but I would encourage everybody to reach out to our amazing panelists to find out uh, more. And that goes for the second panel as well. They're all, everybody's pretty easily available on uh, social media and, and things. Um, so uh, yeah, that was, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, really interesting insight. I noted down a lot of them. Obviously, don't have time to sum it up, but I think my favourite one was that e-commerce is like a sandwich. Um, definitely holistic uh, approach seems to be the, the trick. Now, we've looked at things from a, um, from a sort of consumer experience point of view, and next we're going to look at things from more of a brand point of view. So I'd like to introduce my next pa our next panel, and... Uh, Joining me now, or joining us now, um, are uh, Gulraz Alam, um, who's the uh, Chief Investment Officer, uh, Strategy Officer at Arabi Ads, 
Peter De Benedictis, uh, CMO of Marketing of Microsoft, Stacey Fisher, um, Amash Malik, and Mittal Shah. And in fact, Gulez, I'm going to let you, uh, I won't take up any more of your time. I will let you introduce your dream team. So please, over to you. And uh, I'm going to get my notebook out again and sit back and enjoy this. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Austin. I hope I'm audible. All right. So Austin, we're starting about roughly eight minutes late. So I'm going to request you if you can get eight minute extra because I needed to cover a lot of things. Uh, but let me start actually by thanking Captain Middle East um, and Austin for organizing this discussion and also his team members, Stewards and Anusha for making this happen. Uh, guys really appreciate it. And uh, let me start uh, with the introduction of my wonderful panel and actually with the lady. We only have one lady in the panel. So let me welcome Stacy Fisher. Stacy has about thank you, Stacy. Stacy has about 16 years of experience in the advertising industry. She's worked with diverse set of clients across US and Middle East, and current, currently responsible as the head of digital transformation and innovations at Publicis Group, a company that I've personally worked uh, for a number of years. And apart from um, advising on digital transformation, she's also passionate about wake surfing and hiking. She's already done the Everest Base Camp. Glad to have you, Stacey. Thank you, glad to be here. All right, next up we have Peter. Peter has over 26 years of experience across various industries, ranging from real estate to logistics to healthcare, and now working with Microsoft as the CMO. Peter is passionate about biking. Yeah, thanks. Uh, looking forward to a good conversation. Biking is in the last three months, by the way. It's in FY, you know, 2021, get fit, and biking seems to be the best way until the heat kicks in. Oh, absolutely, to enjoy the beautiful Dubai weather. Absolutely. All right, next up we have Amash Malik. Amash is the Director for Performance Advertising at Bayot Group, with experience, extensive experience in the Middle East, and he's also passionate about technology. Thank you, Gulraj, for the introduction um, and looking forward to the conversation. Pleasure to have you, buddy. And finally, I have Mithil. Mithil Shah, he has a management degree from one of the top B schools in India and currently is spearheading the digital marketing at Santa Point from Landmark Group. And he's also passionate about cooking. So we have a chef in the panel as well. Yeah, lunch is on me, guys, after this. <laughs> Thanks oh, for, for sure, man. All right, thank you so much panelists uh, for your time today and let's make this an interesting and uh, innovative uh, session for all the audience. Um, I normally like to start uh, my discussion with a fun question. Um, and my fun question for today is, tell me about your latest purchase online since we are talking about e-commerce. What was the latest purchase that you did and how was the brand experience? And let me start uh, again with the lady on the panel, Stacy. Okay, so uh, speaking of getting fit, I actually bought uh, two kg dumbbells on Amazon and my experience was quite great because I'm a prime member, so it was pretty seamless. Fantastic. How about Amash? So uh, I have a two-year-old kid, so I bought some toys for him uh, very recently, again from Amazon. We have a couple of uh, loyal customers from Amazon already. How about Mittal? Well, uh, one of my passion is cooking. So I bought a lot of groceries, like, like I do every week. So yeah, Choetram is my choice and Insta Shop is my choice. Uh, I love shopping online. I mean, 2020 really converted me into an online shopper when it comes to grocery. And I have not looked back for more. I think 2020 has converted all of us as the online shopper. And we're going to talk about more about the consumer trends. Uh, finally, Peter. Yeah, it's funny. This is unscripted, but uh, I actually bought a tennis racket yesterday. Uh, so there you go. Um, it, uh, I, I, and you know, it's kind of one of those, I went to brick and mortar, saw some options. It was pretty expensive. I went online. I saw it for 30% cheaper. I bought it online. It was here in a week. So I had to wait a week, but I got a huge price uh, difference. So it's a, uh, Interesting one, great, you know, it's the, the brick and mortar retailer really lost out by overpricing the product. Maybe 
they have a lot of more overheads than the online, but ultimately they lost out on a sale. I ended up buying the same thing for 25% cheaper. Correct. You want to name the brand where you shopped and how was the online experience? Um, actually, it's not a brand. It's not a well-known. It's a wholesaler of tennis rackets. I don't even remember the name. So there you go. It was, it was more about the product <laughs> than it was about the e-commerce site. I felt comfortable that they, they looked, frankly, a little dodgy. Uh, I looked at the same thing on Amazon. It was a little bit more expensive, but I, I went for it. And I, the delivery time was slightly longer, but um, I got it. And it was, it's perfect. All right, Peter, Peter, you touched an interesting topic, which is the challenges that typically a brick and mortar business would face. Um, let me take uh, another uh, you know, input from you on that. Microsoft, you know, traditionally a brick and mortar business. How have you evolved the e-commerce business? Uh, tell us some of the initiatives. Yeah, so I don't know if I'd say that we are a traditional e-commerce business. I think what we do is we enable e-commerce and enable uh, our partners and customers to get online fast and not just to stand up traditional websites, but to use things like machine learning, artificial intelligence, chatbot, in a seamless, easy way to create data lakes, which is actually really where the real value comes for e-commerce customers. I can tell you how we've evolved as a company. Traditionally, we used to sell licenses three years uh, the old timers who are on this uh, call will recall the days of the CD or buying windows in a box and coming home and uploading. You buy a windows or office license three or four years later, it's obsolete and you got to go buy the same thing again. And we realized that was not very customer centric. So we moved to a Netflix model effectively where it's a subscription. You buy office 365. Now you pay by month, pay by what you use. That's far more customer centric. Uh, it's more, more user-friendly. You get a perpetual license which you're paying every month for, but your upgrades are automatic and automated. Now your PC may never be able to keep up four or five years later with the upgrades that we put in, but from a Microsoft perspective, it's a far better experience. And in fact, our cloud offerings now, which are also available on a retail basis, you can pay by the consumption of data per day versus having to buy a big upfront commitment. So I would say our model from an e-commerce perspective is very much about enabling self-service, removing the technical uh, challenges, um, pay for what you use, not for what we uh, or another company may force upon you in terms of features. Um, you know, as an example, we had teams in millions of PCs around the world that nobody knew was there and when online, uh, work came in, we, they just had to enable it, turn it on, and suddenly they're into online learning or online collaboration. Um, so that's kind of how we've evolved into an, a more customer-centric, more um, e-commerce fo focused organization on top of everything that we do for the millions of online retailers around the world. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And if I have to ask you specifically on the numbers, since we are all talking about e-commerce and specific on numbers, what percentage of e-commerce business uh, as a total business comes from the e-commerce for Microsoft? Uh, Any I rough idea? Have, I think you'll have to ask me a sports question. Uh, <laughs> we don't disclose that information publicly. What I can tell you is at the, in this time last year, we had about 500 million meeting minutes on Teams we crossed 5 billion in December, wow. 5 billion daily meeting minutes. So you talk about digital transformation and how as a sort of benchmark for how much people have moved online, uh, that's one that's publicly available. It's massive. You're talking about a hundredfold uh, and five, 5 billion is not a small number. Oh, absolutely. And since we were talking about digital transformation, let me take input from Stacy. Stacy, you're responsible for digital transformation across you know, various categories of your client. And specifically for Middle East, you know, we have the highest, uh, or and I would not say highest, but we're at least beating the global growth rate of uh, e-commerce, which is globally is about 12%. In Middle East, we are growing at about roughly 20%. But when it comes to uh, you know, your set of clients, what are the typical challenges that they face and how are you advising them? 
Yeah, so it really depends upon the client um, in, in terms of their maturity and the set of challenges that they face. Uh, because we have clients that are, you know, perhaps nascent within their journey of, you know, getting online and shifting their inventory online. And we have clients that are more complex that have, you know, partnered with the e-retailers and the marketplaces. So it, it totally is client dependent. However, if I could touch on a couple of the challenges, I think one of the biggest challenges um, stems from, you know, a lack of investment in data. So, there's still a lot of disconnected data sources, and this is, you know, increasingly more important, specifically with, you know, cookies, you know, us shifting to a cookie-less future and the relevance of unifying your single customer ID. So still there's a lot of work. I know we talk about it so much in all of these panels, forums, et cetera, but um, data is still something that I think people have a, a long ways to go. And it's not just from a unification standpoint, it's also from a taxonomy standpoint. And then finally, it's from the standpoint of actually leveraging that data. So, you know, how can you not only make uh, your advertising more relevant to your consumers, but how can you also invest in loyalty, which I think is something that is even more important uh, post pandemic, or I guess mid pandemic, whatever you think we're in these days, uh, because the share of wallet has really decreased. A second challenge that we face um, in terms of transformation with our clients is from an organizational level. So this is oftentimes within the client side, the way that their organizational structure is, it, it can uh, yield inefficiencies. So whether it's an inefficiency from consolidating marketing budgets or it's an inefficiency from you know, teams not communicating with each other or teams not sharing data, uh, you can, we've often seen that um, this type of disorganization can yield uh, other issues and it's a compounding effect from there. However, it's not you know, all doom and gloom. I think that you know, in this past year, we have seen a lot um, within digital transformation. And one thing that I certainly feel encouraged by is that when I first moved to this region, um, you know, everybody was really talking about it and there was very little action. But I think now, you know, everybody uh, had no choice but to take action. So I feel really inspired and encouraged that, you know, more and more we're going to see clients that are willing to you know, fearlessly take a leap of faith and try something new and explore areas that they maybe were a little bit cautious to enter before. All right, thank you, Stacey. And you mentioned about data and I have a very interesting data point from Mithil actually. But before I ask a question to Mithil, Mithil I see some of the audience uh, members are asking the questions. So audience, please keep the questions flowing. I hope I will be able to cover in the short time. Um, all right, Mithil. Uh, data point for you, when I was uh, doing a little bit of research now, I realized that in the Middle East, roughly 60% of consumers would prefer COD, cash on delivery, uh, versus making a transaction online. And you come from Landmark Group, you know, one of the biggest uh, e-commerce group in the region. Is that the main issue? Is that the main challenge? I think, uh, so digital adoption, yes, uh, 2020 has uh, put that at a real speed uh, within across all the consumers, the way they adopt digital for entertainment or for services or for purchase. But I think the real issue is uh, looking at uh, the supply chain challenges that we have. So while COD is more of a habit, habitual change that we have uh, in the region, but that will only go when overall uh, things change, the overall the consumption and the exchange of uh, uh, physical money changes. But uh, we cannot wait for that overall aspect to change. So hence, the shift is more on uh, how do we get um, all our inventory data in one place? How do we get all our customer data in one place, like uh, Stacy said, and really see how these two uh, data centers are talking to each other and we anticipate demand in certain areas and we anticipate demand in certain cities before uh, that, uh, uh, before this, the sales uh, actually do happen. Uh, because Landmark has, uh, more, I mean, at least Centerpoint uh, has more than 80 stores. Landmark has more than 150 stores. The stores are, our, uh, we work in hub and spoke models. So hubs, the warehouses are hubs, our stores are our spoke models. 
and the way we need to talk to uh, the, the 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 systems need to talk between all of these uh, warehouses plus we need to uh, pass on data to our vendors and what data we get back from them at the time of delivery so this entire uh, system is in play but it's 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 going to be a big challenge to resolve this and i think uh, peter and uh, is in a very good <laughs> Uh, uh, position to actually, uh, I mean, deliver this kind of solutions uh, in the region, I, I guess. No, totally, totally agree with you, Mithil. And um, I guess logistics, you know, which is actually delivering the uh, good to the consumer is the backbone of e-commerce, right? I mean, we can see, we always talk about the growth in the e-commerce, but uh, I would also encourage audience to look at the growth in the e-commerce related industries, be it logistics or something else. Yep. All right. Um, we're talking a lot about data and we have Amash. Amash is the head of performance. Amash, tell me, how do you, uh, you know, bring about uh, the disruption and reinvention uh, in your day-to-day -day work when you're looking at this data? How does this data translate and you're able to bring about innovations? So uh, I think I can very much relate with the earlier points mentioned by all of um, the speakers uh, so for, so data like i think data culture or data driven culture is uh, the one thing which we everyone or all of us needs to cultivate uh, because that is what shapes the products we deliver the strategy we work on or even the marketing uh, everything generally at least for us is data driven and uh, uh, i think uh, as uh, stacy mentioned that uh, we at least from our side we invest lots of efforts lots of uh, investment into data integrity security organization uh, in a way which is meaningful for not only a very technical person but also for across the organization who can then understand the data and then use that uh, to build more uh, be better products or even uh, better pricing recommendation systems or uh, targeted approach in terms of uh, marketing strategy so i think uh, that is important and then uh, i think peter also mentioned about being customer centric uh, and i think that is also very crucial to this because um, i think um, mithil can better relate but let's take an example of uh, phone calls or in store purchases uh, these used to be in the recent past uh, like these were considered as something which is offline but now these are very much part of the digital mix because uh, like you have a loyalty program, uh, let's say if I take the example of center point, uh, you have a phone number or email ID attached to that. And that helps to uh, profile a customer, which ultimately helps deliver better products, better recommendations, and even uh, better marketing strategies. Amash, I'm not sure if the, you know, the username, which is basically the name of the user or the email ID or the mobile number should act as the unique identifier because, uh, you know, we don't have the GDPR in the region as yet, but uh, it's not going to be a lot of time before the GDPR comes to the region. That's right. So we That's all right. as marketers yeah. need to evolve um, to figure out what is that uh, unique identifier for a particular user is going to be. I'm going to cover that in some time, uh, but let me jump back to Peter. Peter, uh, my question to you, because, you know, we all talk about disruption and innovations um, and, and specifically for big brands, they have big budgets. Uh, but my question to you specifically is that how Microsoft is enabling small businesses, and I would say small and medium level businesses, uh, which are essentially traditional to move online. Um, if you can share some of the initiatives there, that'll be good. Yeah, I think there's, it's a great one, right? The, the internet is, and I just answered a question in the online, you know, someone is asking, how can a small candy company get online or operate if they, you know, and my answer is any company can get online, uh, either directly, which uh, if they, and it's not expensive to stand up a website and start to market digitally. It's very easy. Uh, you know, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, the, um, so Microsoft specific, specifically though is doing a bunch of things. One is enabling a partner ecosystem that, you know, within 24 hours, any company can go to Microsoft partner, stand up a, a website, an e-commerce site and start trading. Uh, they can easily get online and advertise on Bing or other search platforms. There's a bigger one that we all know. Uh, they can get up and running very, very quickly and start advertising their product and start selling globally. Talking about supply chain, every express, you know, most express 
courier companies operate in every country in the world that you'd want to sell to. Uh, so there's a huge ecosystem that Microsoft enables through Azure, our cloud platform, as well as our partner ecosystem. So that's, that's one thing. The second thing is that we have a very robust startup program we call Microsoft for Startups, where we help through a variety of different mechanisms, young startups born in the cloud type of businesses to get up and running and get scale. That's through technical support, Azure credits, introduction to VCs and funders, Etc. to get enable great ideas to get scale very fast. And we have an office here in the UAE as well that we partner with um, with the Abu Dhabi Digital Authority to get uh, stood up in Mubadala and others to really enable the ecosystem. So I think those are three real concrete examples. Another one I would say is uh, we are sort of pioneering this idea of low code or no code applications, um, which again, a non-coder can stand up and build onto their website. For example, you can stand up on your own, a chatbot on an e-commerce website, literally 24, 48 hours, either yourself or using a partner, relatively low cost and can bring you lots of interesting insights. And that's linked to the other question I answered on the chat. Well, if you don't have cookies, how do you get data? Well, stand up a chatbot on your website and you can suddenly get direct information from your customers and the insights can be pretty interesting so that's a, those are some some other ways and you know the you know the last thing i will say is our data is showing that within the next 10 years 500 billion new apps will be created and most of those will be low code no code uh, type of apps so you know the world is becoming super enabled very fast and microsoft is very much uh, part of that trend Fantastic, Peter. I think you practically have given a roadmap for uh, you know people in the audience who are looking at getting online. So low code, no code, get your product ready, have a fintech solution. And as Peter mentioned, a number of uh, initiatives either from VCs or from uh, different authorities which are helping you do business online. So, and thank you again, Peter, for answering the questions uh, on the chat. Um, all right, let me jump to Mithil. Mithil, I think Stacey also touched upon this earlier. And these days you cannot have a uh, panel discussion without discussing the impact of the COVID. Again, I have a number for you. You know, we were talking about e-commerce. Uh, there was a research that we were supposed to touch $50 billion in Middle East by 2025. And because of the adoption or the early adoption, uh, we are likely to touch $50 billion by 2022. So basically three years advancement in the size of the market. Uh, I should not be, but I'm saying, uh, it is a crisis, but it is also an opportunity, right? I mean, for a lot of e-commerce businesses, it has become an opportunity. So let me ask this question to you. For Landmark Group, how are you translating this uh, opportunity and what does this mean for you? So for the Landmark Group and uh, coming from Centerpoint, uh, we've always, uh, so we started the e-commerce back in six, seven years back for Landmark Group. And then we transformed into having individual omni-channel uh, businesses, whereas Centerpoint being the one of the largest omni-channel uh, business in the region. And from that perspective, we were ready uh, in, in terms of at least delivering uh, the customer uh, a, a complete quality uh, experience while they were shopping online. Uh, what the real challenge really came uh, through is that, again, going back to uh, the supply chain, uh, because when there's a lockdown, we our SLAs go for a toss, right? Uh, we have to move very quickly to deliver those products at, at the customers uh, where, the, where the customers need it at. And that has been the real challenge in the lockdown. It's not, I don't think so. And as Peter said, it's not, it's very easy now, even for big firms or big uh, corporates such as ours to reach new customers. And what COVID and the impact of COVID has done is that more and more people are there online, more and more apps, five, uh, 500 billion, 5 billion, sorry, Peter, 500 billion apps are going to get launched uh, in the next uh, few years. That gives us advertisers even more opportunity to reach our customers. So reaching a customer is not going to be uh, that challenging. It's about ultimately through our marketing channels, through our marketing uh, uh, experiences, what do we deliver in terms of ROI? Because uh, traditionally in brick and mortar, we focused a lot in terms of our ROI. We focused a lot in terms of bottom funnel. 
where visibility uh, investments are typically taken much uh, uh, i mean most of the visibility has been taken in terms of uh, the pure online players they they focus more on visibility and bottom funnel together but that is the advantage and i think from a, a, a landmark group's perspective we have the loyalty program which is uh, shukran and that's really been at the heart of all our customer data that's really been at the heart of the whole or experience and uh, following as per the gdpr uh, guidelines so on we map our customers to the shukran ids so there is no personal data uh, privacy is uh, all in check and uh, we need to map we need to basically break the silos between online and offline and that is the main uh, challenge and the opportunity in the coming years i think and i wish you all the best if you can do the uh, single window of the customer across offline and online i think it's going to be fantastic uh, but since you touched a topic on this diverse adoption let me jump back to amash Amash, uh, COVID has also led to a lot of uh, consumption by users, right? I mean, we all are consuming more and more content, right? Whether it's the OTTs, or whether it's the music uh, platforms, or different sort of consumption, which also for a marketer like you presents a huge challenge. Your marketing mix earlier is very different from what is it today because a huge adoption of internet. Uh, throw some light on how you are deciding your marketing mix. Sure, absolutely. Um, uh, that's spot on. Uh, so I'll share some stats. Uh, so for example, uh, when the pandemic initially kicked in uh, about a year back, uh, and then lockdown happened in UAE. So many of the categories and uh, this happened like across the world, uh, the businesses, there was uncertainty. So we saw a dip in our traffic, but some of the categories, for example, uh, goods in the Bizzle, it ramped up very, very quickly uh, because people were also sort of selling, which is the supply part, and then the demand also sh shot up. Uh, so it ramped up significant, like it exceeded the baseline numbers as well, uh, very quickly. So uh, generally, and even on our marketing front, uh, what we saw was far greater reach in terms of available impressions, which is directly tied into uh, the number of people who were now online in, during that span. Uh, which ultimately meant uh, that since we were already highly adopted uh, in terms of our marketing on digital, uh, the strategy focused heavily on uh, digital, but uh, this also enabled us to reach more and more audience, uh, which we would not have been able to in the normal circumstances. So as you mentioned, uh, there was a challenge, uh, which still is by the way, but there was an opportunity in it as well. Fantastic. Um, totally agree with you. Uh, Stacey, you touched upon this topic earlier that uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, transformation that was planned, but COVID uh, as an opportunity, if I can call it, actually aggravated that adoption. So in your experience with the set of clients that you are advising, uh, what percentage, if you can throw some numbers around, what percentage of these uh, advertisers and digital transformation journey was actually due to COVID? versus it was planned and actually got impl implemented. Sorry, can you repeat the last part about the COVID? Sure. Uh, you mentioned earlier that there was a lot of digital transformation, which typically a advertiser would be adopting, right? I mean, they already have plans for embracing digital uh, transformation, but there are two parts to it, right? I mean, they had plans which would have gotten implemented, let's say over a year or two years, but suddenly COVID because you know, the brands had to recover, they had to respond, they had to re-innovate. A lot of this happened quickly, right? In your experience, what percentage of your advertisers uh, would have done this only because of COVID? I mean, I don't know if I really have a percentage, I would say it's a toss up. Um, but what I will say about uh, the focus of digital transformation uh, throughout 2020, shifted to UX, UI, SEO, and, and really focusing on optimizing the organic visibility of clients' assets. So um, instead of you know, dumping a bunch of dollars into paid media, clients shifted their focus and were more interested on how can they organically increase their visibility, organically get customers to their platforms or to their apps and you know, shift them through the purchase funnel. So, I think that's where, you know, when it comes to the the end to end transformation spectrum that we at, at Publicis deliver to our clients as consultants, you know, we really cover it all. But 
what I can say is that, you know, we had such a massive uptick in this area um, and, and we've been focusing on it a lot. Fantastic. I think there was a discussion earlier about, uh, uh, you know, the cookie less world. So while we are talking about disruption and reinvention uh, in the e-commerce world, there is a disruption happening in our own digital advertising world with the cookie less. So uh, as a CMO, Peter, to get the unified view of the users without cookie, without IDFA, what are you doing? So we, you know, our position as a company is that we support privacy, right? Privacy is a fundamental human right. And anything that gets us closer to user um, generated, user opt in knowingly in an easy way is something that we support as a company. Uh, it's a fundamental right. And, you know, I think we've been pretty vocal as an organization globally saying, if you're, you know, making your customer the product and they don't even know it, then maybe you, you're, there's something wrong with the foundations of your, your business. You know, we, I, I said in the chat, there are many, many ways of acquiring customer information besides cookies. Will it be harder? Yes. Will we have to new, learn new techniques? Yes. Will we have to be more transparent with potential customers around what we're doing with their data, what they're really opting in for? Yes. Will that mean I will lose some visibility on sort of an end-to-end -end customer journey, potentially? But if you are, um, if your product is, is, is sound, if your customers know what they're buying from you, the customers know what they're opting in for, then you know I think it's a good thing overall. And as a brand, that's the way we look at it. I mean, all of us, I think here on this call are based in the UAE. How many times have you been called by a bank uh, for a credit card or a loan recently, not even your own bank? There's no privacy protection. Um, you know, how many times have you been on a site um, the, day, the day after an interesting conversation about a product and it lands up in your social media feed. That's creepy. Uh, that's up, that's me. And I, I personally, as an individual, I applaud the fact that we're moving to a more privacy world. Our company has the same position. It will be harder for marketers, but marketers by nature are, you know, diligent, ingenious, they're, they're creative and they will find ways to engage customers and understand the impact of their uh, marketing. I have no doubt about that, but they'll do it in a way that is not invasive and doesn't take advantage of the naivety of their customers. All right, and Peter totally agree about the, uh, you know, the receiving of the calls and they typically would call you at about 8.30 saying that now we could call you. So totally agree, but you touched upon a topic which is very important for Mithil that, you know, you end up browsing a product and trust me, it's not even after a day, uh, you know, for it's, it's in technical terms, it's called remarketing and for a brand or for any e-commerce business, uh, you know, a remarketing solution either can be in the same session, which means you are still browsing the product after, let's say, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, two hour. It depends on what window the advertiser gives it to the, uh, the platform. So with that, I'm going to jump back on Mithil. Mithil, it's going to be really hard for you. I know it's so important for an e-commerce business to customize the user experience, right? Typically, if I'm browsing a product, I don't end up consuming that product in the same session. I might be doing a research on another platform and I would like to come back on it, right? And that's where you come in, which is the remarketing aspect of it. In a cookie-less world, without an IDFA, uh, what are you looking at and how are you looking at getting that um, you know, unified uh, customer experience? So I think, uh like uh, i think one of the most important aspect is to uh, and this goes more towards uh, creating segments and in seg uh, because in a segment we not necessary we need to have all the information not necessary we need to have a lot of private information of the customers but there are certain traits and attributes of a shopping journey that a, a set of group of uh, customers show 
and that we bucket that into uh, certain segments and that's how then we deliver a more personalized uh, solution so whether that's personalized through let's say our website on our product pages whether that's personalized through our ads whether that's personalized through even uh, through a chatbot because we need to be there we need to deliver uh, whether the customer is engaging with multiple apps multiple uh, uh, multiple digital journeys and conversational commerce is one thing where we can provide a more personalized more private uh, uh, experience to the customers right from discovery till the conversion uh, and at the same time even through our websites even through our marketing channels uh, at the end of the day yes there is uh, the the pixels are uh, i mean i as a marketer would not want to be outside the pixel less uh, uh, world but yes uh, it is going to be a challenge and uh, we will have to find a way because we are at the uh, we've already entered that era with uh, ios right with the ios 14 update yeah. so only time will say how we can find new ways to uh, market and at, at the same time drive roi you know absolutely we'll come up with some innovation and interestingly i'm going to put you a spot Uh, because you mentioned about web versus app, uh, and I want to give this data point to my audience. If you can throw a number, or probably a range, that what percentage of landmark business would come in from web versus app? Possibly a range. I think uh, more than landmark business, uh, e-commerce itself is more than ninety ninety five percent on mobile, uh, and most so of web the, or app on app. Uh, most of okay. the yeah, I was a majority of that. Uh, those sales come from apps. so there's no doubt and we've seen this trend across the sector and across the region more than 2 years back and uh, we all have hopped onto it to drive more of uh, mobile engagement and mobile experiences and this is to stay right uh, this is how uh, we are going to move forward and it's not going to be only experiences on through our apps but it's also going to be where we can deliver through other native apps and where we can deliver a end to end Commerce experience through another eighty apps, through let's say Instagram or through TikTok or through I think any other social media platform. Burberry has launched a social store. Check it out in China. And talking about that, I want to ask Amash any global examples because the you know discussion today is about the reinvention uh, and disruption. Any global examples either in your own industry or anything else that you want to share about uh, highlighting the disruption. sure uh, so i think generally like the key take away for the last year for me uh, personally has been um, being speed uh, speedy speed and delivery being um, uh, growth driven and then ownership so for example um, ford motors uh, i think in march or april last year uh, they announced that they will be making face shields which they never did before so it takes some courage to do things uh, which are not uh, in a usual path but uh like times are definitely fraught but it does not mean that we cannot deliver we cannot achieve certain things and it also links to a general uh, organizational change which we very well adopted to was to not micromanage uh it was to empower uh, the operational workforce uh, to remove the barrier between uh, the leadership and the frontline team so they feel more empowered and have more ownership of things which ultimately de- leads to more speed so it we used to say that uh, fortune favors the brave but now i think it's fortune favors the brave and speedy and you know where stacy the same question to you any global brands that you follow and i'll give you a context of it you know i was recently exposed to you we have something called as live shopping in uh, uh, in the e-commerce uh, right and in china they do a lot of innovations i was recently exposed to a pre programmed avatar that will go live and people are shopping because of that so it's not really a celebrity but it's a pre programmed animated avatar which uses a fantastic amount of motion technology and people are following that and doing the shopping with that any global examples that you want to highlight for the audience which is very innovative and disruptive i mean to be honest with you i don't have a lot of global examples that uh, really come to mind but i will focus on e-commerce because that is what the topic of the discussion is but when you back up and look at e-commerce as a whole there's two key things that really shine out to me as uh, big markers of progression the first is that china has become the first country to have the majority of retail sales made online so you know that just really shows how how they as as a country you know and and all of the capabilities that they have within their country have really accelerated in the times of the pandemic 
The second thing is relative to the US and, and that is that literally for e-commerce, they registered a decade of growth in just eight weeks. And, and that's phenomenal because when you look at, you know, growth that's that big and in that short of amount of time, you know, it really shows that it, it's here to stay. And, and further, there's there's another dissection of that, again, digging into the US e-commerce scene, uh, because I think that it's quite relevant to the people that are on the phone today that are in the MENA region, is that, you know, with consumer behavior now sitting on the 2030 trend line, the companies that were behind the times pre-pandemic have a lot of catching up to do in order to meet the consumer where they lie in terms of wanting to shop online, wanting to interact online, and just in general shifting their behavior to the online ecosystem. The second impact that this has within e-commerce that I've seen, you know, again, within the US market that I think is also relevant for our market is that if you're in essential retail, you know, your, your goods are more essential than ever. And so what that means is that you have to, you know, really um, focus on, you know, making the consumer journey even more seamless compared to your competitors. Because essential retail is, is where everybody is buying and that's where everybody is buying online. So the companies that will win in this space are those that are focusing on making it as seamless as possible. Shifting into the second category is discretionary retail. So, you know, with the pandemic, we've seen really a two, a, a two way shift with essential and discretionary. And if you're in discretionary retail, your goods are more discretionary than ever. So this, this means that, you know, different e-commerce players, if you are in discretionary retail, I think that you need to focus more on capturing the attention and the mind and the heart of the consumer to convince them that this, the discretionary purchase is worth it. So from my side, it's not like I, I can name any one thing, but it's, it's a general shift that I've seen in the US that I think is highly applicable to the MENA region. All right, thank you so much, Stacey. And I have a surprise for my panel, and I know Peter has to drop, so I'll start with Peter. I call this a rapid fire round, and give me your honest and apologetic and non-diplomatic answers. And one of you will get um, a chance to win a gift hamper. And for my audience, this is your chance to know the panel up close and personal. Um, and I know because Peter has to leave. So Peter, I'll start with you. Um, I'm looking essentially for one line answer. What percentage of your traffic comes from mobile web versus desktop? Mobile versus desktop. Mm. You can pass. Don't don't, don't, pass, and I actually don't know the answer to be honest, but uh, I would say on the B2B side, it skews heavy to desktop still. We're not a, we're not a, a business that people buy on mobile. You know, on web traffic, probably will follow industry trends, but we don't track that to be very honest, um, not for our commercial parts of our business. All right, first advertising dollars to TV, outdoor, Google, Facebook, or any other channel? Pick one. Still paid, paid search is still, like for our direct to customer business, Google search is still taking a lot. If I say on a, re that on a global basis, on a regional basis, it's Facebook, Facebook ads. I'm surprised you didn't mention Bing. And then, well, and then last will be LinkedIn. LinkedIn for targeted ABM, there's nothing better than LinkedIn. All right. What's your most hated business expression? Oh, there's, One so, line. Many. there's so many. Uh, let's take that offline. <laughs> for sure. All right. Your marketing mantra in one line as a CMO. Uh, don't spray and pray. Fantastic. Meaning, yeah. Got it. Uh, you bet on one technology or innovation or disruption that will have a big influence on the e-commerce in a short term. When I say short term, I mean the next two years. I, I think COVID, 
COVID has just done a mass. There's nothing more innovative that is that has forced people to digital transform their business than the pandemic. No single technology. The pandemic has enabled e-commerce in a way that no other sing, single tool would or could. All right, very innovative. Okay, pick one. Peter as a boss or Peter as a colleague? Oh, Peter is a boss. He's I'm, I I'm hope your team is part of the call. <laughs> All right, meetings with PowerPoint or whiteboards? I got to say PowerPoint. Come on, that's a tough question. <laughs> PowerPoint. <laughs> Very interesting for you. CMO of GE Healthcare or CMO of Microsoft? Uh, Microsoft. I love GE, but uh, this is the best job I've ever had. All right, and my final question to you, your mentor, Linda, the founder of Better Homes or Bill Gates? Oh, Linda, you see, that's a, that's a, that's a no, no brainer. She's uh, awesome. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. That was very uh, honest and non-diplomatic answers. Thank you so much. All right. With that, let me move to Mithil. Are you ready, buddy? Yep. Make, make it rapid fire and make it witty. Sure. Your take Please on try. programmatic advertising for e-commerce. Still a lot of work to do be done over there. Got it. Would you use mobile marketing for performance or for branding or for both? For both. First advertising dollars to Google, Facebook, YouTube, OTT, programmatic or any other channel? Content, I think. Brilliant. That, that will enable everything else. It's, I give you a brilliant <laughs> answer. Your one line take on influencer marketing driven e commerce, this is social e commerce, or your one line take? Great uh, to begin e commerce, great to scale e commerce, uh, difficult to sustain. Your bet on one technology innovation disruption that will have a big influence in e commerce? Uh, my bet is still on any innovation uh, that comes through social media because that's where entertainment is, that's where. Uh, most of the time is spent uh, by users and anything that can commercialize that space is where the innovation lies, I feel. Keep a check on what's happening in US and China. I think they've been fantastic when it comes to social media driven e-commerce. Yeah. All right, choose one. Agency life or the client side? You've been part of both. Client side. <laughs> Somebody is talking. All right, e-commerce marketplace or direct to consumer? Uh, direct to consumer. All right, advertising through cookies or device IDs, which is a better unique identifier? Device IDs. Fantastic. Cash on delivery or digital payments? Digital payments, hands down. <laughs> hands down, absolutely. Yeah. And your focus more on mobile web. I think you already answered that question, but yeah, your focus mobile, on mobile web versus mobile and only mobile. All right, thank you so much, Mithil. Um, fantastic answers. and. Let me move to Amash. I know I'm running out of time, but just last five minutes. Um, Austin, just last five minutes. Promise I'll finish it quickly. Austin, uh, uh, sorry, Amash, are you ready, buddy? Sure, yeah, go ahead. What percentage of your traffic comes from web versus app for this region? So again, uh, relating to Peter, uh, anything which is B2B oriented, it's always desktop, but for us, uh, from a consumer point of view, it's always 80, 85 plus. On mobile. You know, that's that's why I have the rapid fire. I'm not looking for the diplomatic <laughs> answers. I'm looking for data for audience. All right. Your take on programmatic advertising for the EPMG group. Uh, so for EMPG group, it's important, uh, especially helps uh, with the retargeting stuff. All right. Uh, would you invest in a CDP, consumer data platform, for customizing the consumer journey sure. or invest in a better analytic platform? You know, you lead the data practice as well. I think better analytics platform for CDP, the only challenge right now in this market is uh, the data is not powerful enough at this moment. I agree with you, it's segregated. Um, one newer business model for online classified industry. I think the ultimate would be to uh, include some sort of transactional uh, business model. Innovative, okay. And uh, you're better on one technology innovation disruption that will have big influence on the e commerce. 
I think social commerce. I think Mithil or someone, uh, Peter mentioned as well. Mithil the social mentioned. commerce would be one thing uh, that definitely would pave the way. I'm I'm noting this down. Co uh, uh, Peter mentioned COVID. Mithil mentioned social commerce, and you agree with him. All right, choose one: digital for performance advertising or for brand uh, brand building. Uh, both channels might vary. Your, your most important metric for digital advertising: CPA, CPM, or any other. uh i would say cpa first advertising dollars to google facebook youtube ott programmatic or any other channel uh depends on the vertical and the objective but i would say google all right and finally to you english ads for the audience or vernacular advertising which one works better uh english predominantly for this region uae based region All right, thank you so much, Amash. And I finally have Stacy, the lady in the green. All right, Stacy, all the best to you. According to you, what's the biggest challenge for online retailer uh, retailers today? I'm sorry, I'm speaking fast because I know Austin would be saying that you're running over time. But uh, according to you, what's the biggest challenge for online retailer uh, retailers today? So I'm going to say for bricks and mortars, it's connecting online to offline. All right. Digital transformation should be a KPI of CMO, CDO, or CTO. None of the above. It should be for everybody at the organization, whether you're an entry level employee or a C level executive, because digital transformation is paramount. It's only driven by you know all of the employees at the organization to each adopt it into their way of working. All right. Your top qualifying question when a client is talking about or asking you for digital transformation. Oh gosh, <laughs> there's so many. I mean, a lot of them I think are are on this topic about the cookieless future and what they need to do today to be prepared for it. All right. Your bet on one technology innovation disruption that will have a big influence on e-commerce. uh GPT3 which actually someone on my team educated me about so it's a uh, super advanced natural language processing i think that if you haven't heard about it look it up yeah i'm not going to talk about it because it's your rapid fire but i was so tempted to share my knowledge on that all right choose one digital adoption versus digital transformation both i mean they they both have to happen but i would say probably digital adoption and i would be surprised if you haven't adopted digital i mean it's 2021 right <laughs> come on yeah all right disruption in digital to come from the large giants or the new age companies new age i think that uh, there's a big fury that's brewing especially with the startups interesting you mentioned because all of us still look at um, amazon for disruption or innovation in e-commerce and but it's interesting the way you mentioned all right most important factor for digital transformation people product processes people people Fantastic. 100% because without the people nothing will transform fantastic i'm going to put you in a spot on this one publicis media e-commerce solution or publicis dmt solution pick one or dmt solution oh gosh you're really putting me on the edge here if i have to pick one i would say dmt and that's because commerce technically is a part of the dmt framework all right thank you very much stacy thank you very much um, and thank you audience uh, for spending your last 45 50 minutes with us i hope uh, the session was uh, Uh, useful for you and thank you so much panelists uh, for a fantastic session austin over to you thanks a lot for that that was absolutely uh, brilliant i don't know whether you had secretly rehearsed your rapid fire round beforehand but it was um uh yeah there were some really good insights there um and uh, i think i particular i think the one of the things that really stood out was stacy's answer when you you were asking who should lead uh change and she said that it has to come from absolutely everyone there was stuff in there about um so so really good stuff there was stuff about sort of a lot of actionable advice and i also liked the fact that um uh, both uh, mithil 
Mitchell talks about sort of conversational commerce, and I think that uh, that rather spoke to Peter's point about how um, you know if you have uh, if you have chatbots or even heaven forbid real real conversations there, you don't need cookies so much because you know your customers that way. There's ways to um, you know who knows people might actually start uh, sharing information sort of organically. So there was some uh, really good stuff there. Um, thanks a lot. And uh, obviously we've. Uh, We've run out of time. I'd always like to keep these things going on, but uh, you can reach out to all my panelists on their various social media mm -hmm. handles. They're all on, uh, you know, all popular things. Um, you'll find a lot of them in the in the magazine fairly regularly. I've got um, a good few contributors uh, have graced our screen today. So um, thank you very much to uh, well to all the panelists, including uh, uh, Sabiha Iqbal from Accenture Interactive, Stephanie Cunningham from. Uh, from uh, Omnicom Media Group, uh, Stefan Davis from uh, uh, Almasud Automobiles, uh, Khalil Yassin from Unilever, uh, Gulraz, and the, this panel, Gulraz Alam from Arabi Ads, Peter De Benedictus from Microsoft, Stacey Fisher from Publicis, uh, Amash Malik from uh, Beut and Dubizel and uh, Mittal from, uh, from Landmark Group. That's been a really, really good lineup today. We've had a lot of different it looks at things from a lot of different angles. We've had a lot of fantastic different insights um, and sort of, yeah, sort of de definitely a lot of sort of viewpoints. Um, I'd like to just thank, once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors um, who include Adobe Ads, which is the largest e-commerce marketing platform in the region, and um, Shwari Group, which is the leading media representation group in the Middle East. Um, both of you guys, I mean, obviously we wouldn't, none of us would be sitting here in this digital room it wasn't for your support so thanks a lot for that and again i can only emphasize keep reading campaign keep uh, you know keep following us on social come over to uh, instagram and marvel at our brand new blue tick we're very proud of that um and uh yeah looking forward to seeing you at the, at the next one of these we've got a ramadan uh, special coming up in april so um hopefully see you all then thank you very much to panelists attendees behind the scenes people absolutely everybody you've been fantastic Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It was lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, panelists.